In late 2018, Toby Fox, the creator of the overnight 2015 hit Undertale, released a demo of his upcoming title, Deltarune. Deltarune 2 became an instant smash hit. Many instantly fell in love with its characters and world, and began feverishly discussing and theorizing the moment they could. Some, myself included, believe that even the small chunk of Deltarune we have received stands equal to the entirety of its predecessor. Deltarune is not just an amazing follow-up to a modern classic, it's not just a top-tier turn-based RPG in bullet hell either, but it is also a love letter to fan creators and fan works of all kinds. In order to be able to get a complete grasp on the context of this, we need to look at Toby's history as a creator first. Toby Fox first entered the public scene with fan works of his own. His public life as an online creative began on the first day of 2006, when he released the Earthbound ROM hack Arn's Winter Quest. It was a two-month labor of love by a high school student. Despite its production time and quality, it has been largely overshadowed by the hack he would enter into a competition two years later, his widely known Earthbound Halloween hack, which was not just an Earthbound fan hack, but also a fan work and crossover with the Brandish series of RPGs, borrowing its main protagonist. Later on, Toby would, along with many others, become an avid reader of the webcomic Homestuck, Toby did not respond to a call by the author for musicians. He instead relegated himself to the creative cast he was used to, a fan creator. Despite refusing the call to do compositions for the webcomic, he began doing piano covers of songs that others had created for it. Through his production of these covers, an example of fan art for Homestuck, he was found and contacted by Hussey, and he began composing for him in an official capacity. Even Toby's first original game, Undertale, wore its inspirations on its sleeve. From using earthbound sound fonts, sampling sound effects from old games and advertisements, etc., he always kept himself tied to his inspirations, where he began, and what he was a fan of. In fact, the most well-known song from the game, Megalovania, isn't an Undertale original. It wasn't even first used in Homestuck. No, Megalovania is fan art. It is a fan composition for the game Earthbound, created by Toby for the Earthbound Halloween hack. Megalovania began as the theme for a fan-made boss against a scientist turned violent from guilt. What, then, separates Megalovania and Alphys Takes Action, other than time and further usage in other media? Undertale blew up almost instantly. In fact, it got even larger than Homestuck, much to the surprise of many. And just like Homestuck, its fans ranged in age range and artistic experience, but it particularly spoke to young creatives. With Undertale's massive fan base, simple but three dimensional and memorable characters, and basic plot structure, many young and slash or new artists saw a great jumping off point. They wrote about and expanded on concepts introduced in Undertale, ranging from the grim topic of Flowey's manipulation of Papyrus to the bright and hopeful lives of the cast of characters after a true pacifist run. Some mixed their love for Undertale with their other passions. Many were still going through their edgy middle school phase, and so things like Underfell were born. Others were still on their cultural obsession with zombies, and so created things like Zombie Tale, Underdead, and Axe Tale. <laughs> Even political ideas were experimented with. Many saw the monsters leaving the underground not as entirely hopeful, but potentially dangerous. Some artists use this and our love for these characters to create stories that test our moral compasses in a more contemporary way, drawing parallels between the monsters we love joining the modern world and our current immigration crisis. However, many saw this not as a sweet example of young artists getting their start by spinning off of media they love. Instead, they saw it as a, quote, cancerous spread of the fandom, mocking it publicly and making cringe compilations at these pure expressions of passion and love for the art that brings us all together. A more modern example of this behavior can be seen in the reaction of Fortnite's rise to fame. Many millennials and Gen Xers vowed to break the cycle of generational condemnation, said that we wouldn't fall into the trap of mocking children for having different passions than we did. Yet so many who swore to do better than our forebearers now take videos of small children having fun and compile them for grown adults to laugh at and deride. Doing a Fortnite dance is seen as cringy. The presence of one makes something cursed. Just as many of us are doing a Fortnite now, many reacted the same to Undertale. 
I don't know if it's malice, a dislike for the popular, internalized self-shame, or a mixture of all three and more, but cringe culture has established a solid and very toxic foothold in online communities. From the moment Undertale released, Toby demonstrated a clear respect for the power and spread of fandom. On his Tumblr, he included a request for the inevitable fan artists that would come. He knew how the internet worked. He knew that his creation would have lewd fan art drawn of it, and he knew it couldn't be fought. Instead, he just gave a simple request. If your art or fan community is not safe for work in any way, use the term Undertale, T-A-I-L, rather than the name of the game. This would keep SEO clean for his family-friendly game, and allow for the healthy growth of the fandom, while keeping drama regarding the lewdness of the fandom to a minimum by keeping not safe for work artists self-quarantined. This didn't work perfectly, of course. Nothing could in a community as large as Undertale's. Toxic personalities are always bound to crop up, not to mention people just flat out not getting the memo. And don't get me wrong, this is not me defending some of the rank shit that occurred in the Undertale fandom. The worst of Undertale fans rivaled the worst of bronies, but it was a tiny minority considering the actual popularity of the game. So while I think the perpetrators should all have their kneecaps powderized, I don't think it really shines poorly on Undertale. The point I'm trying to make is that Toby understood how the internet worked and respected fan art, and chose to politely ask people to keep themselves contained. This respect for fandom followed him into his creation of Deltarune too. When it released, it too contained a plea to its fans. This one was more broad and demanding, however. Online discussion should be held off for 24 hours after the game's release. Meeting his respect with their own, almost everyone followed his request. Of course, some broke or refused this self-inflicted embargo, but many more followed it, ensuring they didn't spoil anyone before they had a chance to play the game. And now we finally reach the point of this essay. Now, of course, I can't speak for his actual intention on these things. I don't know what is in his head. All I can do is analyze the art he puts out and try and put it into perspective. Toby's deep ties to his inspirations became a core underlying theme in Deltarune. It isn't just heavily inspired as Undertale was, but is instead a love letter to fan works and the creativity of fans as a whole. The characters and their arcs are incredibly tropey. In Chris, Susie, and Rawl's eye, you have the knight, barbarian, and white mage. Susie is a classic bully-turned-buddy trope, with a few twists sprinkled in the middle, but her beginning and ending match the arc perfectly. Lancer is a harmless villain, and another example of a villain turning into an ally. Lancer gets his design from a pack of art based on playing card suits, envisioning them as humanoids. In fact, all of the suit NPCs in Deltarune are derived from the pack. Toby was so heavily inspired by this, he made the entirety of the Dark World, itself an obvious reference to A Link to the Past and its name and aesthetics, an abstraction on various toys and board games that are in a room in the school. While it may not literally be a story made up by Chris and Susie, it is still, at least in the meta sense, a world created based on existing properties and tools. It is a remixing of assets to create a new experience. It isn't chess, checkers, cards, or sham. It is its own creation, a crossover between these various pre-existing mediums, with the creator's imagination mixing it all together. To top that off, various small artistic choices within the dark world are based in fanfiction metatropes. A prime example being the line of text upon entering the field of hopes and dreams, telling you the name of the song. Many fan writers have a habit of syncing some scenes to music that they were inspired by, or that the scene is directly based on. In order to not leave the reader in the dark, they interrupt the story to give you the song recommendation. Deltarune is no different. You leave the dour region of the abandoned castle town into a bright pastel forest. But before you can fully experience soaking it all in, white text appears artificially on screen telling you the name of what you're listening to. This happens nowhere else likely either due to its potential annoyance, or as a mimic of how many fanfiction authors take their lengthier stories more seriously as time goes on, and drop the eccentricities of their format to instead emulate an official, publishable, novel-esque style of writing. Regarding the overworld, at first glance it appears to be an official take on what would happen after a pacifist ending of Undertale, but there are differences. Undyne has both eyes, Asriel is alive and in college, Braddy and Caddy hate each other, Alphys likes edgy anime rather than sweet anime, hates the original Mew Mew Kissy Cutie, and the most dramatic of it all, 
Alpha and Undyne have never met. With all of these returning faces, but with such dramatic differences in their personality and lifestyle, the only word that can aptly describe it is, well, an alternate universe. Toby has, in effect, canonized all of Undertale's fan creations in alternate universes. In a stroke of genius, empathy, and camaraderie, he validated all the amateur creators online by putting the world of Deltarune and retroactively Undertale on the same level as the ones created by fans. Of course he holds nothing but respect for fan artists. He himself got his start as one, and still is in the spirit to this day. Hey, thanks for watching that video all the way through to the end. I have the credits for every video, song, and image that I use in this video scrolling by on the left. I have my coffee, Patreon, Twitch, and Twitter over on the right. Uh, you can give me money on coffee and Patreon if you'd like to, and I will give you a shout out on this insulate in future videos. I haven't really done much with Twitch so far. I plan on streaming Fallout 4 and PlayStation 2 games there in the future, uh, so stop by if you want. You can follow me on Twitter if you'd like to keep up with my thoughts and my day-to-day, -day, or if you're just looking for announcements for when I'm posting more content like this or when I'm streaming. So this video was all about fan art, and I would feel weird if I made this video and didn't give recommendations for fan art to seek out. So what I will tell you is you should check out Zarla S's comic, uh, Hand Plates. It's about Sans and Papyrus being test subjects for Gaster. It's extremely long, but very, very good. Um, you can find that on their Tumblr or DeviantArt. Um, I am also going to suggest The Thought by Tratzeer No Reeve. I am definitely butchered that pronunciation, but you can just find it by looking up Undertale The Thought comic, and you could find it pretty easily. Uh, it is about an alternate universe where Sans killed Frisk right after coming out of the ruins and absorbed all the human souls, and it's way more cerebral and thoughtful than that description makes it sound. And I think you would really enjoy it. Um, outside of comics, I'm going to suggest uh, Skeleton Boyfriend by Muzak Mize. That's M-U-Z-A-K-M-I-S-E. Uh, it is a synthwave cover of Bone Trousel, but that doesn't do it justice. And I'm also going to recommend Bone Klezmer, which is Bone Trousel done in the genre of music Klezmer, which is also really, really good. Uh, thank you again for watching the video all the way, and have a good day.